thank you uh, once again. I can do an introduction, I suppose, but uh, <laughs> I, just, I don't want to <laughs> surprise you. So, <laughs> um, but I, I guess uh, uh, let me introduce Sam Raskin, who will be giving this third talk in his uh, mini course on um, geometric language and 3D mirror symmetry. Uh, please take it away. Thanks. Um, OK, so uh, today I just sort of wanted to uh, try to um, describe a little bit just how uh, the the main construction in this result that Justin works. Uh, I think that it's just um, uh, some uh, it's some generators and relations thing, and uh, and I just sort of want to uh, to say it to try to give a flavor for like what uh, some of the objects that we're talking about here actually kind of look like concretely, and just uh, I don't know. It's a it's a construction that can be explained in a few minutes. So, um, so I'll give that a shot. Um, so, <clears throat> and there's some signs I always get worried about, but I think that will be okay. Um, okay, so, uh, so let me just sort of um remind what the main theorem says so uh, first of all or reminders and uh notation <clears throat> so i'm going to introduce a space y which is uh kind of on the b side of our equivalence it's the main object and um, i'm going to call this and so this is the space of maps from the puncture disk to rom into the stack a1 mod gm and concretely, this parameterizes the following kinds of data. Um, L nabla s. <laughs> so here, L is a line bundle on this um, puncture disk at a point. Nabla is a flat, well, automatically flat. Um, it's a connection on L. And s um, is a global section of L um, that's annihilated by the connection. Um, so, uh, so in this case, um, our our theorem says that um, the category of shriek D modules on um, the loop space for A one is equivalent to um, certain category of uh, in coherent sheaves, whatever it means, on the space y. So, um, so this is the theorem, and I would sort of encourage you, like, not to worry too much about these decorations. I'm uh, uh, writing them in because uh, I know how to do that. But basically, you know, you should think in in more naive terms about about these various things. This is going to be some you know, modules over some rings with some equivariance properties. And this will be some kind of modules over some file algebras. Um, uh, yeah. And um, OK. Oh, and by the way, as of, as of Yesterday, the paper is up on my web page. Finally, I know I keep talking about that every time, and it's because it's been weighing on my mind. And uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, OK, so uh, here, the left hand side um, has to do with uh, file algebras with specifically a vile algebra um, in infinitely many generators. Um, so a vile algebra, well, meaning like the algebra of polynomial differential operators on some kind of affine space. Um, and what uh, I want to explain um, today, so the goal um, for today is to explain 
um, how to um, relate file algebra in one generator. Um, to uh, the right hand side. Um, and what this has to do with our theorem. So uh, first I'll try to explain just literally this, this construction uh, and then I'll try to be more specific about uh, about like, uh, you know, some commutative diagram involving this and so on, that kind of thing. Like, what does it actually have to do with anything? <clears throat> um, uh, but I think it's a concrete enough statement. So let me, um, uh, I guess, maybe say W um, will be our vial algebra. Um, on a generator on generators, let's call them like X and uh, something I'll call a partial derivative with respect to X with the basic relation that the bracket is equal to one. So this is partial X times X minus X times partial X. Um, so, very concrete situation. I have to give you, you know, some object and two endomorphisms that um, that has these basic relations. Um, so the construction is actually only going to see a part of um, see sort of a piece of the space Y um, that involves regular singular connections. Um, which means order one pole um, um, so let me uh, um, kind of maybe introduce a little bit um, more notation here. So, um, so I have my space Y, so kind of um, <clears throat> So this is parameterizing data of a line bundle, a connection, and a section. Um, this maps down to um, the space of local systems on this puncture disk. So this parameterizes just same kind of data, but I forget the section. Um, so mapping here is what I call local systems with a singularity of order less than or equal to one. Um, and I'm just gonna tell you kind of explicitly how this looks. So it's gonna be a copy of A1 mod Z the affine line mod uh, integer translations. The coordinate on this A1, I'm always going to call lambda. So I'm, that's what the sub lambda is. It's just sort of a reminder about some notation I'll introduce in a second. Um, and then there's also going to be kind of an annoying stacky factor around that you can kind of uh, uh, forget until uh, basically for the purposes of today, the stacky factor do doesn't enter in except kind of at the, at the last statement. So you can follow everything basically. If, if you forget this, but um, uh, but it, it's a reminder of, of some kind of GM equivariance at, at some stage. Um, and then, uh, okay, this is where we run into troubles with the notation. So I'm also going to write um, log to mean like there's this annoying mod Z around, um, and this will be what happens when I just consider my A1 instead of a1 mod z. <clears throat> um, and here, OK, and so uh, by definition, I'm going to form some kind of fiber products, uh, y less than or equal to 1 and y less than or equal to 1 log. Um, and just like what's kind of this construction, so 
um, here, this bottom arrow from here to here is going to send um, a point lambda, and maybe I'll kind of ignore the line, um, to uh, the line bundle O on the puncture disk. Um, uh, and connection nabla is equal to d minus lambda times dt over t for, for t, the coordinate on my puncture disk. Um, that I'll, I'll fix in order to just kind of have coordinates on everything I talk about to make things more concrete. Um, and uh, uh, what do I want to say? Oh, if you had the line, then you would just be tensoring this trivial line bundle with that line. That's all you, um, all you do. So BGM parameterizes one-dimensional vector spaces, and maybe it's more confusing if I write it than if I don't. So that's why I'm not writing it. <clears throat> um, and this only depends on uh, on on a lambda. Like the resulting connection only depends on lambda mod z. Because if I do a gauge transformation by like the nth power of this coordinate, I'm going to change lambda to um, lambda plus n. Um, uh, okay, so um, so again, this is basically. I mean, this is the space of local systems with regular singularities. Um, it kind of uh, there's a sort of uh, computational fact, which is that. It embeds inside of here as, uh, as some kind of, um, uh, basically at the level of coherent sheaves, all of these kinds of things um, with these kinds of embeddings are fully faithful. So it's kind of convenient fact to know. Um, so there's, for our purposes, it only involves this kind of piece of the space Y in a precise sense. And, uh, and, then, this, uh, and then this guy is something you should think of the log thing is making our spaces like a little bit more um, concrete um, and by getting rid of the z factor. I should also say uh, uh, a, um, a heuristic that you can take is that a1 mod z is the same as c star. This is a heuristic because that's something analytic. You need to know the exponential map in order to do an isomorphism like that. So if you uh, take, take that heuristic, the corresponding point in c star up to whatever factors of two pi i or something is going to be the monodromy of your connection. Um, but in algebraic geometry, there's a real difference between a1 mod z and c and gm, the multiplicative group. And that difference um, uh, makes a difference in terms of like uh, how you think about, um, about the, it makes a difference for the categories of coherent sheaves and things like that. And this is the right guy that appears. So the, the, uh, natural definition from the algebraic geometry perspective, from the Durham algebraic geometry perspective, um, is the right one in these kinds of um, games. Um, OK, any questions at this point? Uh, I guess I should open up the chat. Um, um, so now I want to say, how does this space y less than or equal to one log look. <clears throat> um, so again, this is the space parameterizing, you know, basically regular singular local systems, except kind of you know, mod out by all the gauge equivalents that I could, and, uh, and uh, a flat section of this. So in other words, I have basically this lambda around, I'll forget the line factor for the most part, and, uh, and then a flat section of this connection. Um, so, uh, so I'm just going to sort of um, forget the BGM factor for now. Um, so then um, I have basically this O, um, which is my uh, line bundle on the puncture disk, um, my connection nabla, which is equal to D minus lambda over T dt, and then I have a section S which is a section of this line bundle, aka a Laurent series, some um, a sub i t to the i greater than minus infinity. Um, so it's, it parameterizes this sort of data um, uh, with the basic property that this nabla of s is equal to 0. So let's unwind what that means. So this means um, I have coordinates um, 
lambda, and then sort of uh, infinitely many a sub i's, a0, a1, a minus 1, um, like this, which are, uh, so for instance, the function a sub, well, the function lambda on a point like this is pulling out lambda, like that term of the connection. Um, the function a sub 0 is pulling out a sub 0, like the 0th Laurent um, coefficient of my flat section. So that's what I mean when I write these as, when I'm thinking of these as functions. There's some, uh, some blurring of, of notation in, in these two things, but that's what I mean. Um, and then uh, what are the sort of kind of properties of these coordinates? Um, so uh, there's a kind of naive one, which is that like um, a sub uh, minus i is supposed to equal zero for i sufficiently large. So this is a kind of like in scheme style condition. So when I write this, it's like not, it's not like universally true. It's sort of like on every point of this in scheme, so, uh, infinitely many coefficients vanish. So, um, so on any given Laurent series, so to say any, uh, you know, the, inf the tail to the left is zero. So I'm gonna say this, I, I'll write it once just to acknowledge that there's this in schemey thing happening. Um, and then I'll, I'll uh, absorb it into some pictures in a minute, <laughs> I guess. Um, so, um, so there's this, and then, uh, and then there's this basic property that um, nabla of the section, um, so this, this translates to the following. So this is, um, so this is d minus lambda dt over t times the sum of the a sub i, t sub i. So that's equivalent to saying that if I just take the derivative here, I get a sub i t to the i minus one dt, and then I'll move this term over to the right-hand side. Um, this is going to equal lambda times the sum of a sub i t to the i minus one dt. <coughs> um, and then I don't know why I moved it over because I sort of want to move the terms back in a second. <laughs> so what I'm really getting is that um, lambda minus i a sub i is equal to zero for all i and z. Um, so um, let me kind of draw some pictures for a second. So if I only um, used um, lambda and a sub zero. So you can note these relations, they actually, like, I only need to know lambda and like, these relations don't mix the a sub i. And that's a nice thing about this regular singular case, actually. It gets more, like the fact that these equations are sort of homogeneous in terms of the Laurent coefficients is special to this regular singular situation. The equations get more compl complicated with higher um, orders of singularities. But for the moment, um, uh, or I mean, for, for today, all my equations are sort of homogeneous here. So I so it makes sense to only use like a few Laurent coefficients at a time. So like, basically, if I only used these two things, I would have um, sort of the following kind of picture. So it would just be like a cross where this is kind of my lambda coordinate and this is my a sub zero coordinate. Um, and uh, and I would have the basic relation that like lambda times a sub zero is equal to zero, and that means either lambda is zero or a sub zero is zero. Um, uh, if I use lambda a sub zero and a sub one, then I would get a picture kind of like this. So this would be my like um, my like I sort of have this a sub zero that's measuring the height here this a sub one that's measuring the height on here, this is my lambda axis, and this is glued on at the point like kind of lambda equals one, um, whereas this is like lambda equals zero. <clears throat> um, if I use all, 
a sub i for i greater than or equal to zero, let's say. I'm going to get a picture like this. Where I've kind of glued on infinitely many pieces. And I have to remember that there's something infinite happening here. And there's two ways infinite things can happen in this algebraic geometry. It can be an inverse limit or a direct limit. So it's about um, what kind of, it's like Laurent series. So Laurent series are, are an inverse limit because they're like, I don't know, like, sorry, Taylor series are, are a uh, uh, inverse limit because it's like an infinite product. Um, and so this is like a pro um, kind of direction here or inverse limit. So that's how these things are glued on. So basically I have this picture mapping to this picture. I have the picture with uh, a one, a zero, a one, a two, mapping to this picture. And I'm taking the inverse limit of all of those pictures. Um, and, uh, uh, and the result in this, I mean, the way this kind of geometry works is this will be something that's like a scheme. It's hugely infinite type, um, hugely singular and, uh, and so on. But that's kind of, um, this basic picture. Um, and I'm going to call, well, maybe I'll go back and give things more names in a second. And so then if I use all a sub i sort of for i and z, then I'm going to get um, a picture like this, where now it kind of goes in both directions. Um, and so over to the right is the pro direction. And over to the left is an end direction. So like um, basically I have these, so um, it's this kind of semi-infinite geometry where like uh, there are these two infinities and the two infinities behave uh, somewhat differently. And so, um, and here I have this sort of, uh, uh, I can only draw it as some kind of uh, basically comb, but, uh, but when I take the comb and I go in the right direction, I sort of have to remember just like uh, I just have it in my brain that that's like the pro direction and that when I go to the left, it's sort of this end direction. So I'm like embedding this picture into this picture, into this picture, into this picture and taking the union. Um, and so uh, those are the basic pictures of these spaces that I want um, to keep in mind. So now, um, <clears throat> okay, so maybe I can pause for questions for a second. Okay, um, so now there's kind of two things, I, two sorts of symmetries I want to remember. So one is that um, uh, before kind of on this, um, well, like here there's this BGM around this like, um, so, so like on the local systems level, I quotiented by some kind of trivial GM action. But on these spaces, that GM action doesn't look trivial anymore. That GM action is scaling my flat section. So if I have a flat section, this S, I can just multiply it by any invertible number. I get another flat section and that's a symmetry of my space. And so um, what I'm gonna sort of remember is that there's this um, GM action on this picture, um, which is uh, vertical scaling. So um, that's like the GM action that preserves this picture. Just it's and it's it's the right one. It's changing this. You know, it's changing this a zero um, because that's that's what it that's what it does. Um, it's changing my section. It changes this a one similarly. Um, it's just rescaling the um, the coordinates by an invertible scalar. Um, and so. Kind of secretly when I draw these pictures, maybe I, I have a mod GM in mind. So I imagine that I've sort of contracted this into some kind of non-Hausdorff, I can't draw it sort of picture in which these are sort of contracted to points and there's a kind of BGM sitting along this line. And uh, and maybe because I'm bad at drawing that, I just won't do it in the pictures. Um, okay, and then um, I want to, uh, give this, these guys names. So this is going to be um, what I call um, 
this is what, what we called before, this Y log. Oh, sorry, there's one other symmetry I want to mention, which is that um, here, since like Z acts on, on this, there's gonna be a Z action upstairs also. Um, and what does that Z do? Um, so Z is gonna act on this picture by translation to the right. Again, there's some manifest symmetry. It, you know, this the stuff about like the the tails, the pro and in directions. That's that's a little bit asymmetrical. It's about the tails, you know, going off to the side. So you can perfectly well um, do that. <clears throat> um, and maybe I'll say uh, uh, kind of explicitly um, at the level of my coordinates. So first of all, um, a GM action is equivalent to a grading. Um, and I'll say that the degree of the AIs is equal to one for every I, minus one, some convention, let's just say one, and the degree of lambda is equal to zero. And so if you um, just look at our, so that's because uh, these these guys sort of genuinely get scaled, um, whereas uh, this guy is invariant under the scaling action. So usually the degree of of a function under this dictionary is like um, uh, uh, so this is a grading on on functions. So um, what you say is like the degree n part is the stuff that gets multiplied by sort of lambda or mu to the n when you scale by mu. Um, the eigenfunctions. Uh, okay, so, and yeah, I should say, you can see, just see, I mean, as a sanity check that these relations are um, homogeneous. Um, so that makes sense here. And, uh, and then the second thing is that the Z action, let's say, um, that the generator, well, maybe I'll just call it T inside of Z, sends um, T of AI to A I minus one and T of lambda to lambda plus one. So again, there's some sign to fix once and for all. I fixed my sign this way. So this is what happens if you pull back, pull back under multiplication by like little t. Um, the, the uniformizer on my puncture disk, the coordinate on my puncture disk. <clears throat> um, and so this is a, an automorphism. Um, okay, so um, uh, so that's kind of starting to set up this, this notation. I, I hope it's, um, you know, again, just, it's just sort of unwinding the construction. So the major thing is that you have these AIs, which are measuring the coordinates of your Laurent series. Um, and then you have this Lambda, which is telling you what the regular singular connection is. Um, and just sort of starting to unwind the, the symmetries and, and draw pictures. Um, so I want to give some more names to things now. So in our paper, um, we call this space Z and then there's a less than or equal to one. So this is um, kind of uh, where um, S is a regular, so no poles, or you could say holomorphic, so to say, um, section of this. Um, this line bundle. So our line bundle here is kind of extended to the disk and you can think about it in, in these terms. <clears throat> um, and, uh, and let me uh, kind of give some, um, some more names to things. So um, I'm gonna say, so, so I have the Z less than or equal to one um, 
And I'm going to call this also z less than or equal to one sub zero. Sub one, z less than or equal to one sub two. Uh, and it'll be contained inside of z less than or equal to one sub minus one, and so on. And so, um, so these are these uh, sort of things that are bigger and smaller than my z are sort of I think very uh, suggested by the picture. So like the one that's smaller than it with the one is like this. The one with the two is where it's like this part of the picture. So. Um, I'll say z less than or equal to one sub um, sub n is where, uh, and then this is the really tricky part. So I have to get a n minus one, a n minus two, a n minus three, et cetera, are zero. Um, so it's, um, it's where um, s has, a pole of order um, less than or equal to minus. Um, as a section. So it's just the sort of, it's, it's what I get by starting with my Z and then doing this translation using my favorite automorphism. Um, and there's this fact that they're kind of nested. Um, so, okay, maybe it's not stated as clearly as as a person could possibly like, but is is a maybe I can pause for questions again. Okay, <clears throat> so. Now, what do I want? So I want um, a sheaf, a coherent, um, I'll put coherent in, in uh, quotation marks for a second because the finiteness conditions are, are slightly subtle. Um, sheaf on this space, um, y less than or equal to one. So, um, with an action, so I'm going to call this sheaf f sub one because it generalizes to f sub n um, in our paper. Um, with an action of um, of this vile algebra, and actually we'll see that the relations get swapped. So, um, so this is the um, vile algebra. Um, with opposite multiplication. Um, and it, so it's going to be an action like by endomorphisms. And that's going to be ultimately what, you know, this like sort of spectral realization of vial algebras is. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, so that's the goal right now. So this data of a coherent sheaf on here, um, but, you know, put quotes because I don't. When I say coherent, usually that means finiteness properties, and, um, and I'm not really suggesting that. Well, I say quasi coherent. Um, on this space is the same thing as a Z equivariant um, sheaf on this y log less than or equal to one, which is equivalent to sort of z and gm graded on, or z and gm equivariant on this uh, space. And that's why I brought this page over is because this is a, you just see that, that this is the space modulo z um, because of how this fiber product works. There's just like the difference between these two is a um, z torsor. Um, so it's easy to give the definition of this um, this sheaf. So I'm also going to call it F one. 
So what I would like to say is that I just take the structure sheaf of this Z thing. However, that's not actually Z equivariant because it's not preserved under translation to the left in the picture. And so what I'll do is I'll take the next best thing. So um, I'll define this F1 to be the direct sum of the structure sheaves of um, Z less than or equal to one sub N for all N and Z, which is also, you could say the direct sum of kind of this T to the N of O Z to the less than or equal to one. Oops, um, maybe like up to zero. I'm writing structure sheaves. I'm not going to write like push forward at every stage here, but I'm, I'm thinking of that structure sheaf as a sheaf on this uh, Y1 log thing. Um, so this is sort of, you know, main idea of like one or whatever is that this is the object where we're looking for. So I haven't quite said yet why we're looking for it. I'll give the a posteriori explanation afterward. But this is the um, the object. <clears throat> um, so it's it's got this GM equivariance that's sort of built in here, like kind of clearly everything I said was invariant under that scaling. And then I forced it to be Z equivariant just because I took this object and I'm like, look, see, it's Z equivariant. It, was, it had to be invariant under T, and I just forced it to be. Um, <clears throat> uh, so this is kind of um, coherence here, um, what it really means is that um, it's sort of built from Z averaging. So it's like this construction and built from, oops, built from, uh, uh, built from in this case, like in principle, you would allow cones and things like this, um, but it just like is average. So there's nothing do so like this construction. Um, coherent sheaves on y less than or equal to one log. <clears throat> and this is part of, so this is a technical comment, but but uh, uh, the what I want to say is that um, the way coherent sheaves on in schemes work is like structure sheaves of sub schemes nice subschemes are are coherent um, so uh, that so that's kind of matching this um, this picture so like this guy is a scheme or maybe scheme mod GM and so this is going to be a coherent chief I should say it's not a perfect complex if you know what these words mean um, because uh, uh, embeddings of like when you embed uh, something along a singular locus and push forward a structure sheaf, you get something which is not perfect. And so the fact that like each of these embeddings, that the space gets more and more singular each time you do one of these embeddings is telling you that this thing is hugely kind of non-coherent. Um, sorry, non-perfect, it is coherent. Um, and that's why intco appears in our theorem and not something else. Technical comment for people in the know. Um, so this is the object. So now I need to define um, two maps, x and partial x from this F1 to itself. Um, uh, satisfying file algebra relations, actually up to sign, we'll see. Um, so let's do the first one. So this map x, so uh, these maps, like there's kind of not, maybe a huge, they'll sort of have degree one and degree minus one respectively, the way like these guys have kind of degree one and degree minus one for the GM action on A1. <clears throat> um, so let's do this multiplication by X construction. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take O Z less than or equal to N um, and it maps by restriction to this O Z less than or equal to one N plus one just because this guy is contained inside of this guy. So if I have a function on here, I can restrict it to a function on here. Um, so um, this is some kind of heading. <laughs> so take the direct sum over all N and this is my X. 
again, kind of clearly every, like it's um, the GM equivariance isn't even a question. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, the, the Z equivariance, it's again, because it, it's, that's, it just is, everything's sort of invariant. That, that whole story is invariant under this translations picture. Um, so okay, clearly Z equivariant. Um, so that's my first operator. My second operator works as follows. So my partial derivative sub x. So this one um, is not hugely involved, but it's slightly more involved. And we'll have to know some of the stuff I did before. Um, oops, sorry, that's not equal to one. So again, it's gonna be a direct sum over all n's um, and I'll uh, explain. That works. So um, let me, this is where I have to get certain kind of lines, right? Oops, so I'm going to actually do, I'm going to normalize things with n minus one here. So here it kind of went from n to n plus one. This time it will go from n to n minus one, but actually we'll start here. <clears throat> so this has a surjection. So this, this is um, my restriction map that I had before onto z less than or equal to n less than or equal to one sub n. And uh, the important thing that I want to use is that this is actually this, um, sorry, n minus one. So it's this thing mod um, that equation a sub n. So once I set, um, a sub n minus one. Yeah. So once I set that a sub n minus one equal to zero, like that's what it means to be this thing. It's like that if n were zero or something, I'm saying like set the minus first, you know, th this uh, z minus one, it's allowed to have a minus first Laurent term also. And if you set that minus first Laurent term equal to zero, then uh, you have a regular section assuming all of those other lower ones were zero already. <clears throat> um, so this is my, um, my restriction map. Um, so now I have um, a map uh, from here to itself, which is multiplication by lambda minus n minus one. So this is some kind of global function on my space y, if you want, because lambda is one of the coordinates. And I can just multiply from here to here. And that's, that gives me a map from the structure sheaf to itself. Um, and now what we observe is that this factors uniquely through here. So this, um, and maybe I'll uh, also write it this way, because the two things are, are equal. Um, so this is, um, uh, this factors specifically because, um, lambda minus n minus one times a sub n minus one is equal to zero. That's what a co-kernel, that's what a quotient is. So giving a map from this quotient means like a map from here to here that kills this element. Um, and like, because like this map does kill that element. So that's what I need in order to get a factorization like this. So I get, you know, just to rewrite this in a horizontal orientation instead of a vertical one, I get a map like this. So the direct sum, and I'll, maybe I'll just kind of sloppily call this like lambda minus n minus one. So it's sort of multiplication by that element, remembering that it, that really makes sense for here, but it factors. Then I'll take the direct sum over all n's. And I'm going to get this map um, partial sub x from this f1, which is the direct sum of all of these guys, to itself. We could put n minus 1 if we want. 
And again, it's Z equivariant and so on, basically because lambda gets translated by one when I um, apply my automorphism. Um, and so again, um, Z equivariant. Um, so, um, so now there's a sort of trivial calculation, which is um, this file algebra relation. So I want to compare um, uh, dxx um, and like this composition and uh, if I run them in the opposite order. And so kind of in order to do this, like at the nth stage, like sort of on the nth sum end, say it that way. What I'm doing, so I first run x and then I run this partial x. So I take this, I restrict to oz less than or equal to one and plus one. And then I apply this sort of lambda minus um, n minus one. It's going to be n here to get back. But if I run them in the opposite order, um, then first I apply lambda minus um, n uh, minus one to get here. Um, and then I restrict here. Um, and uh, what I see is that partial x minus x partial x um, is equal to um, lambda minus n minus sort of times the identity if you want, minus um, lambda minus uh, n minus 1, which uh, these two guys cancel, the minus n cancels the minus n, and then I'm left with uh, two minuses on no three minuses in front of this minus one and so this is equal to minus one um and so this is my sort of opposite um file algebra relation um So uh, one proposition that I'm not going to explain is that the self X of F1 um, are exactly um, generated by this file algebra. So all self X, so the higher self X vanish, first of all, and, um, and in degree zero, you actually get exactly this um, this vial algebra on the nose is a kind of cool thing. So we get a map from the vial algebra. This is the assertion. Um, a sort of general kind of categorical consequence is that um, there exists a unique functor from the category of D modules on A1 which is exactly this category of modules over this vial algebra to this category end co-star of y less than or equal to one. So this is kind of, again, these end coherent sheaves basically, um, such that the algebra of differential operators maps to F1 compatible with the fact that, you know, this is sort of W, it has an action by W op. So, like as an as an action as an object of as a left module it has an action on the right um so this is compatible with the w op action um and moreover this functor um is fully faithful so it's fully faithful like this is encoded in the proposition.
Um, Okay, so now let me kind of answer explicitly, like what exactly does this have to do with our theorem? So question, and here's the answer. <clears throat> so if I take this loop space on A1, so I think about this as sort of the moduli space of Laurent series. There's the subspace that last time we called L plus A1. So this is sort of Laurent series. Um, this is um, Taylor series. So in other words, uh, only coefficients greater than or equal to zero. And this has, um, so maybe I'll call this I, and I'll call this projection pi. Um, this has a projection down to A, A1, which is sort of, um, Depending, so to say, like it's like f maps to f of zero. So it's taking the zero Florent coefficient. Um, and uh, the way things work is that there's some pi upper shriek and then i lower star. So I kind of can take a d module on this a1, pull it back to here, and then embed here from the category of d modules on a1 into whatever this fancy module category is here. So this is just a certain way of producing D modules on this space. Um, this is sort of our, you know, our theorem. Um, and then uh, just now I explained that there should be some kind of construction like this. Um, this category embeds into here. That was, I mentioned some fully faithfulness earlier. So that's what happens um, here. And this diagram commutes. Um, by construction of like, the theorem is proved by doing this kind of thing and building out from it. Um, so uh, that's the answer, answer to the question, what does this have to do with our, um, with our theorem? Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's uh, basically what I've got. You know, I would say like, um, so I, it's some, it's some, uh, I, I think nice construction um, of, of a vital algebra. I actually, I, I don't know anything um, predating this that's a sort of coherent description of a vital algebra in one generator, even um, that kind of simplest thing and you know without without kind of having an invertible um, element somewhere around and so uh, even though this is a kind of very classical thing or whatever I, I think I think this sort of description of a vital algebra already is something new um, in geometric representation theory and uh, yeah the, the version with higher order singularities that takes a little bit more um, more thoughtfulness, I would say, about how you kind of set things up, but um, it's the same uh, kind of ideas and, and um, you sort of have thicker and thicker versions of affine Grassmannians appearing. So like the Z is sort of living inside of the affine Grassmannian for GM and you start seeing kind of infinitesimal neighborhoods of it instead of, of uh, just Z. So that's the sort of conceptual little bit um, maybe a appearance of that of that Z and the way to think about what happens with higher order singularities. And, uh, and otherwise that's sort of the way the argument goes. So you kind of have to set up, um, so there's a bunch of kind of inductions to show things like this fully faithfulness. Um, and at the end of the day, there's a similar induction to show essential surjectivity um, uh, once you sort of have built out this functor, but um, those are the main ingredients. So, uh, yeah, I think that's what I've got. Apologies if it was too technical for a talk, but um, I hope not. Oh, well, let's that, thank Sam for a great series of talks. So. I thought it was not too technical, but I don't know. That's my perspective. <laughs> great. Okay. Yeah. It's good to hear that someone thought that. <laughs> um, any questions for Sam?
maybe this is a technical question, but I, I had one, you were just mentioning at the end about um, the appearance of Afrin Grismanians of the Taurus. I mean, and on some intuitive level, is that just the fact that we're having loops arise several ways or? Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's um, basically like um, when you, so it, when you think about like what a GM local system is, like in this formalism, sort of by definition, you take like one forms and you mod out by the gauge action of the loop group. And so that that kind of has a canonical torsor for, I mean, this the way to generalize this log construction basically is to say like that has a canonical torsor for the Grassmannian, which is where you only quotient by like the L plus GM. Um, Kinds of thing, and uh, yeah. So, in in other words, if you take a line bundle on the disk with a connection on the puncture disk, that's a torsor for the Grassmannian for GM over the space of local systems. Um, and that's where it that's where it's coming from. Yeah, this one has. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, Sam, uh, for the wonderful series of lectures. So uh, my question is uh, probably uh, a little bit naive. So uh, if I understand right, uh, your talk today is about the example where uh, you have on the one side the A twist of a free hyper, and on the other side you have the B twist of uh, a U1 gauge theory with again some one hyper or something like that. Yes. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, I mean, fr from a naive physicist perspective, one may have thought that's not a terribly complicated example if you wanted to study, uh, you know, 3D mirror symmetry or something like that. Like if I were to pick some interacting uh, 3D field theory, uh, two of them that float to some common fixed point, that's kind of the usual setting in which people study 3D mirror symmetry. So, what are the additional technical challenges uh, like to adapt this formalism to more general 3D and equal to four theories? Um, so, um, yeah, so the, the first thing is like, uh, so, So like for me, at least like in the, you know, mathematical formalism I, I know better or whatever, like just um, like electromagnetic duality, like sort of S duality for U1 in 4D is something non-trivial, the, the mathematical consequences of it. It's something, uh, it's something uh, classical. Uh, it's not something I would like uh, write a paper about or something, but it's something that I would like teach a grad student who is trying to learn um, you know, learn their way into geometric Langlands. It's it's a, sort of it's a it's a non-trivial construction. Um, so I don't know like exactly how a physicist feels about uh, S duality for U one, how, how trivial it is, or something. But but so that that's uh, 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 for me this this theorem it's um, harder than um, that statement. Um, it's harder in a couple. Uh, different ways. And, and part of it is that there are compatibilities with it already built in, but it's a, it's a non-obvious thing. Um, in terms of other kind of 3D n equals four, um, uh, yeah. So yeah, just in saying we do get all abelian examples uh, sort of immediately from this. So we wrote it in terms of one hypermultiplet and U1, but um, if you wanted to take several hypermultiplets or several U1s or something, that, that kind of thing is, um, is is uh, basically built in here. It's just um, so uh, th these are boundaries to the 4D uh, S duality statement. That's basically what you mean. By yes, for, for abelian gauge groups. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, so mathematically, I, I think even in some sense physically, like it's not um, uh, examples that involve non-abelian gauge groups, for instance, are not currently accessible because like our knowledge of, um, so first of all, there are a number of additional kind of complications that come in. Um, so just the fact that like, so to say like gauge theory for a non-abelian group is like way harder than gauge theory for an abelian group. 
So those, those kinds of things have mathematical versions and it just, things get a lot harder. Um, and, and so uh, the state of the art is like that we, well, and, and then I would say also the theorems are sort of, sort of um, you know, conditional on like S duality basically for, um, in, for non-abelian groups, which is like geometric Langlands and local geometric Langlands and stuff like this. And we just don't know, um, you know, there's a lot of progress, but there's not, um, it's not at all settled. And so in some ways um, for non-abelian examples, if you think in terms of this like, you know, boundary of, of Yang Mills sort of thing, it's hard to, um, it's hard to even formulate the right question because it's conditional on geometric Langlands. So you could start to um, build, you know, there's a sort of standard story I learned from, from Justin about like building, uh, which, which goes back to probably Hanami Witten about building examples of 3D mirror symmetry from kind of, or maybe Gyota Witten, uh, building examples of 3D mirror symmetry by sort of um, composing boundary conditions for Yang Mills. Um, and, uh, and there you produce things that you technically aren't like at the boundary of any 4D theory, but maybe they, um, they still give interesting examples of, of S duality and you still see kind of non-abelian reductive groups around and things like that. And again, those kinds of examples aren't going to be um, in my mind presently accessible because they're exhibiting those same features. So I, as far as I know, like for this kind of theorem, we've basically proved the only example which is uh, accessible using current uh, technology. I'd be glad to be wrong, but you know, or current, current just sort of knowledge of things like geometric Langlands. Um, but it's a, I think it's also a, a test case that these ideas that you know, have been circulating for um, a few years about what these line operator categories look like and how they interact with um, mirror symmetry for these topological twists, like I think it's a, um, a solid test of those ideas. So. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know, I, I get that the really exciting stuff is about the non-abelian examples, but um, it's from the mathematical perspective, it's just not. Any further questions for Sam? Please go ahead. I, uh, so uh, maybe you already said this, but what is it about the non-abelian case that, you know, can one pinpoint what it is that makes it harder to formulate things in that case, mathematically? Um, <clears throat> so there's kind of two things that happen. So. Um, so one is like purely kind of on the B side, on the spectral side. Um, you know, what happens in our example is, is kind of the following. So there's this moduli space of local of GM local systems, like line bundles with connection. Um, and that's something very kind of lovely and explicit and finite dimensional mostly. And um, and it's just, it's just, uh, it's great. And then we have this space Y that lives over it. And uh, it's like way more complicated. So hugely non-Eutherian and so on, but but uh, hugely infinite dimensional. It's sort of not the kind of space people have um, thought about before, uh, thought about at least like in any, um, uh, you know, kind of proving a theorem about it kind of detail um, before our work. Uh, and so that's, it's just like, there are a ton of extra challenges that come up and maybe half our paper is, is about those sorts of challenges. Um, so once you go to non-abelian G, even that moduli space of local systems, it becomes just like a mess and like how to work explicitly with it and like kind of prove things in a, in a meaningful way. It's just kind of not, um, not possible to be as, it, it's just not as nice a space. It's like not as finite dimensional, all of those kinds of things. Um, and, uh, and so when you kind of, for me, like adding those additional um, kind of technicalities about like having matter around basically as opposed to pure, pure gauge theory like that that is it's like um it's like a kind of daunting challenge on top of something that I don't feel like I have enough control over 
as it is. Um, so that's uh, that's my sort of emotional response in, in some way about about thinking about the B side there. But then the, it, sort of in addition to that, in addition to that, there's um, there's the fact that really the formulation of that we looked at last time for like s duality for boundary conditions um, in, in these kinds of terms, like when you have this non-abelian group around, it says that two categories are equivalent, that that the two categories match under geometric Langlands and uh, under local geometric Langlands, and so. It, um, for uh, for uh, the group GM, that's a sort of very concrete statement, sort of because, like, whatever, Dirichlet is dual to Neumann and, and that kind of case. Um, but, like, because that's not true for non abelian groups, exactly what the formulation should be, like, this kind of, this, like, even what, what you, um, how you expect to probe it, what, what the, categories are, it's related to Chris's question from last time also about like not understanding temperedness and we don't really understand the, the spectral side of, of um, local geometric Langlands. And so um, uh, kind of even expressing what exactly you expect to prove is a little bit fraught for the current state of knowledge, I think. Um, so that, that's kind of the, that's where I see things. Great, thanks. It gave me a sense. Okay. Yeah. Any further questions or comments? Okay, well, in that case, maybe we should uh, thank Professor Raskin again for a very nice series of lectures. So.